Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And we are today continuing the two-part episode of the events that led up to the last public guillotine execution in France. If you missed part one of this story, in which we detailed the vanishing of Jean de Coven and the man who she was last seen with, go back and listen to that before jumping into this one, because we're really not reviewing here, and we're kind of picking up where we left off, so it will feel completely confusing if you don't have the backstory. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the trial, the verdict, and the aftermath, including the execution. Heads up, just in case. Uh, like the first part, this episode will involve discussion of violence, specifically murder. We will also talk a lot about capital punishment. When we left off last time, Eugen Weidmann had been captured by police and had confessed to several murders, including the death of the young American tourist, Jean de Coven. On December 9th, 1937, Jean de Coven's body was found. It was right where Weidmann had told the police that it would be. He hadn't taken it very far. It was buried under the front porch of the cottage he lived in. Jean's wallet had been emptied, but most of her personal effects were still there with her, including the new camera that she had taken to Europe to capture memories of her travels. When the film was developed, it showed the last photos she took were of Eugen Weidmann in his apartment. When they found her, she had a cord tied around her neck. She had been strangled. Weidman had refused to accompany authorities as they went to his home to exhume the bodies of Jean and also of Fritz Frommer, who was buried in the cellar. He said that he couldn't bear the sight of it. When Eugen confessed to Jean's murder, it's reported that this was the only one out of the six that he exhibited regret over. He would not say her name, but wrote it on a piece of paper. And he is said to have wept as he told the police, quote, last July, I did something horrible. He went on, she was gentle and unsuspecting. I enjoyed speaking English to her, which I learned in Canada. When I reached out for her throat, she went down like a doll. After collecting evidence, French police transferred Jean's body to a coffin and contacted the DeCoven family to make arrangements for her to be laid to rest. Her body was transported back to the U.S. on the White Star liner Berengaria. It arrived in the States on December 28, 1937, The family had it taken to a mortician to prepare for a proper burial. Although the answer was surely painful, they finally knew what had happened to Jean. Her mother was quoted in the Boston Globe as saying, quote, that means our last ray of hope is gone. That was quoted, of course, when she heard the news of Weidman's confession and the exhumation of the body. Although the family had believed that she was dead, this still just came as a shock. On December 10th, Weidmann's three accomplices surrendered to police for questioning. They had been staying at the resort town of Nantua near the Swiss border when Jean Blanc's brother phoned them to tell them they were wanted in connection with the arrest of Weidmann. It might be tempting to suspect that they had gone on this trip to avoid police, but that was not the case. This was more of a coincident situation. They were already in Nantua when Weidmann was apprehended, having gone there to scope out a possible business opportunity. According to Jean Blanc, he and Million were planning to open a lumber business there, and they quickly returned to Paris, and they all turned themselves in. When Million and Trico arrived at the Versailles police office, they already had a lawyer with them. There were some, but not many, conflicting accounts about exactly what happened during the murders when Weidmann's confession was compared with his friend's statements. For example, Millon and Tricot had both claimed that the plan had never been to kill Leblanc just to rob him. Tricot had told police that Weidmann had told her he'd murder them both if they told anybody about it. Mion admitted he was present during LeBlanc's murder, but that the entire crime was Eugen's doing. Mion also characterized his relationship with Weidmann as having helped a down-on-his-luck friend when Weidmann moved to Paris without any money. Because of this, for a time, Mion was considered to be the leader of this gang rather than Weidmann. Mion was described in the press as having, quote, gone completely to pieces in his cell. Guards said he frequently broke down in fits of hysterical weeping, moaning, I've done nothing, nothing. 
Jean Blanc claimed to have a high degree of ignorance regarding much of what has happened, and that actually did line up with a lot of what Vaidemont and Million had told the police. He was, it seems, someone that they kind of strung along, showing him just enough danger that it kept him interested, and of course he kept loaning them money to cover rent and other expenses. He constantly asserted to police that he was just a small-time criminal, involved in things like forgeries and counterfeiting, certainly not murder. The first few days after Weidmann's arrest were busy for the police as they searched the villa for evidence, and they found a lot. The search continued for months. One thing that was noted was how impeccably clean the house was. It was regularly dusted, and the furniture had white covers, which were described by the police as spotless. Early on, investigators found several suitcases filled with what papers reported as, quote, feminine apparel, meaning lingerie. Several of the items were laundry marked with names. The items marked Janine were presumed to have belonged to Janine Keller, but they also found items that had been labeled with other names, Caroline and Josephine, as well as other items that were not marked, but were in a range of different sizes that made police worry that there may have been many more victims. They believed, when they counted it all up, that the clothing belonged to 12 different women. And the entire garden of La Vousie, the villa, was dug up, although no additional bodies were found there. Investigators also found a lockbox in which Weidmann had carefully stored the passports and other legal documents that belonged to the victims. Just as the rest of the house was neat as a pin, these items had been organized and carefully stored. On December 28th, several weeks into Weidmann's home still being searched, letters from numerous women were found among his things, a reported 500 letters. He had been placing ads in English papers asking women to send him references. Some of these ads indicated that he was hiring a governess for his children, others that he needed an English tutor. This was, of course, really similar to the situation that led to Madame Keller's murder, so authorities were planning to try to track down the writers of the letters to see if anyone was missing. In a follow-up to the letter situation that appeared in the London press, it was announced that Scotland Yard was able to determine that four people on its list to follow up on, which were three men and a woman, were safe. But more curious was the fact that there were two people in the information that French authorities sent that just didn't seem to exist at all. They weren't instances of people who were missing. The addresses that their letters appeared to be from were not real addresses at all. They were made up. Yeah, we have no idea what the scoop was there. If people were just trying to, as a safety measure, not give a real return address or if there was something else going on. Once Weidmann was in custody, the police were quick to release a statement that made clear that they had not been pleased with the way they had been characterized as not taking the DeCoven case seriously. The statement, as relayed in English language papers, read, quote, Inspector Chaillé was assigned to the DeCoven search. He speaks English, especially American English. He succeeded in listening in to telephone communications of the kidnapper and concluded he was a German-American. After inquiries, the police did not reject the theory that Ms. DeCoven had been murdered, and they followed up on several clues, including one in Toulouse and another in Switzerland. At no time was Monsieur Chalet on Weidmann's track. After Weidmann's confession, he spent his time in prison in France in a way that was very much like when he had been incarcerated in Germany. He read a great deal. One of the books that comes up in account is Fenelon's Les Aventures de Telemaque, in which the writer used Telemachus' search for his father Ulysses to examine political issues in the late 17th century France, so not exactly light reading. Wiedmann also started working on his own memoirs, which was something his lawyers suggested. Weidmann was described in a 1938 article in The New Yorker, so in between when he was apprehended and when he went on trial, as, quote, an exceptionally handsome male in the medieval manner. He was reportedly dismayed to not be able to be more fastidious in his appearance once he was in custody. Being unshaven and not being able to wipe his face with a handkerchief, something he had been denied out of fear he might try to kill himself with it, is said to have made him embarrassed when he appeared before authorities. In addition to forbidding any sort of material that he might use to harm himself, the prison also assigned Eugen two cellmates who were instructed to alert the guards if he attempted self-harm. 
That may have been the case, and he may have been chagrined to not be as tidy in his appearance as he had wished, but that model behavior that he was known for while incarcerated earlier in his life started to fade a bit. During the trial, the multilingual Weidmann started claiming that he had forgotten how to speak French. He would only speak German or English. He had been charged with six murders for all the victims that we've mentioned, the head of his defense team was Vincent de Moro Giaffrey and had worked on other high-profile cases. Moro Giaffrey's second was René Jardin, who was notable because she was a woman avocat at a time when that was unusual. She would remain associated with this trial throughout her career. Yeah, she was the one that had suggested he keep that diary, and she, some quite a number of years down the road, uh, published it with a lot of of notation and kind of her thoughts on what had been going on. She really um, seemed to feel that he was not in his right mind. It took a lot longer to start the trial than had initially been anticipated by authorities. In early January 1938, so a month after Weidmann was apprehended, the investigating magistrate, Georges Berry, told reporters that he really expected to have all of the evidence processed and ready to hand off to prosecutors by the summer. He mentioned July specifically. But there was so much evidence that they needed far more time than six months to do all that processing. The trial didn't start until March 10th, 1939, 15 months after Weidmann had been arrested. In a moment, we'll talk about the way the press turned Eugen Weidmann into an almost mythic figure of dark possibility. And for that, we will take a quick sponsor break. There was a British tabloid story that appeared in February 1939, so just before the trial, that indicated that friends of Wiedmann were trying to break him out ahead of the trial by posing as gendarme to infiltrate the prison and escort the suspect to a waiting car. This, it was reported, was all conveyed to Wiedmann by a letter which looked harmless, but on closer inspection was found to contain invisible ink detailing the plan. The prison was said to have doubled the number of guards after this escape plan was discovered. This is hard to verify, and it comes from a pretty dubious source, but we mention it to illustrate the degree to which Eugen Weidmann had become an almost mythic boogeyman in the international press by the time the trial was approaching. His crimes had been reported in just horrifying detail for more than a year, there was a constant frenzy for more information, even after most of the facts of the case had been disclosed and discussed over and over. In the public, there was a combination of fear that people could easily vanish, especially tourists, and there was the desire for some combination of justice and vengeance. So running a story that suggested that the most frightening man alive also had people trying to break him out of prison was a surefire way to attract readers. Yeah, we'll talk about the press a little bit more at the end, and then I definitely want to talk about it in the behind the scenes this week. Uh, it was something of a marvel, as all of the the various evidence and statements were collected, that it had taken an accident, really, the tracking down of the Arthur Schott business card to discover Jean DeCoven's murderer. Because it came out that even beyond Million, Blanc, and Colette, there were other people who knew about the murders and never said a word about it. For example, Million reportedly told his father about Jean DeCoven's murder, and his father told his boss. And there were allegedly two additional people that got information about DeCoven from Million or secondhand from one of the people that he had confided in. So while all of these people seemed to be blabbing to each other, authorities had never heard a word of it. But this was all disclosed by the defendants before the trial began. On the first day of the trial, Eugen Weidmann was not his own best witness. He reportedly told his lawyer, René Jardin, that he believed he would be executed, that he was ready to die, and that he wanted to, quote, be in order with God before that happened. Although Jardin, who was the attorney that Eugen was most comfortable speaking to, had instructed him not to confess anything in court, and to not say anything that might endanger their chances of claiming insanity, he did not take her advice. When questioned, sometimes he just shrugged, but he did confirm his confession of killing de Coven, Fromer, and Lesobre. 
He confessed to the rest of it during the following days, although the murder of LeBlanc was something that he and Mayon blamed on one another. They both acknowledged being involved, but each man said the other one had been the primary aggressor. In mid-March 1939, as prosecutors pressed Weidmann for details about the murder of Jean DeCoven on the stand, the defendant was reticent. He refused to give any specific information about how the night had played out, leading the judge to accuse him of indifference to what he had done. Eugen replied, I am not indifferent, but I am not in a fit state to talk. He elaborated when the judge asked what he meant that he was not morally fit to talk. When the judge told Weidmann that he hoped to hear some words of at least pity for Jean from the defendant, all Eugen said was, I can only confess. But he had given more details in his initial confession. And though he was not willing to reflect or elaborate on that information in court, his co-defendant, Roger Mignon, did confirm that things had happened as Weidmann had originally stated Jean and Eugen had arrived at the house in St. Cloud between 6 and 7 p.m. on July 23rd, 1937. Although, according to Mille, she was not killed until after 11 p.m. She was buried under the porch that same night, and then rose bushes were planted over and around the area the next morning. The last day of Jean DeCoven's life actually has a few inconsistencies in terms of how the details were confessed, at least as they were reported in the English language press. Remember, this is all being translated as it's being reported. An article in the New York Times just two days after Weidmann was taken into custody indicated that he told police she had not died right away. He had tried and failed to strangle her and had to do so a second time using two handkerchiefs knotted together to do so. But that still placed it very near their arrival at the St. Cloud Villa, not at the later hour mentioned a moment ago. The earlier death is the more common version of the story, and there are mentions of the handkerchiefs being found at the villa while the home was being combed for evidence. Regardless, though, of which set of specifics had truly played out, there was no debate that Jean had been killed by Weidmann that night. One thing that became less mysterious and shut down the speculation about fetishes was the reveal during the trial of the reason that Eugen Weidmann usually took personal effects, things like clothes and shoes and wigs or other accessories from the victims. He wasn't just keeping those for himself or hoarding them away somewhere. He was distributing them to his accomplices so they could use them as disguises. Jean's aunt, Ida Sackheim, wanted very badly to testify in the trial. She had hoped that the police would call her to Versailles so she could do so, but they never did. She actually sent a telegram protesting the family's lack of representation at the trial. But she really didn't need to have done that, and they really didn't need her, because even if she had testified, it probably would not have changed the outcome at all. In an effort to avoid the death penalty, Weidmann pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. But the prosecution made the case that the methodical nature of his preparation for the crimes indicated otherwise On March 31st, 1939, the case concluded and the jury went into deliberations. It took five hours, not because there was much to debate on the matter. Weidman had confessed. There really wasn't any doubt regarding his guilt. But they had before them 80 different questions for many different crimes, including thefts and levels of premeditation that they believed were involved. Weidman was, of course, convicted. For Gene DeCoven's death, he was found guilty of murder without premeditation. In the cases of Le Sobre's and Frommer's murders, he was found guilty with extenuating circumstances. For the remaining three charges, the murders of Janine Keller, Joseph Cuffy, and Roger Leblanc, they found Weidmann guilty of murder with premeditation. He was also found guilty of attempting to extort ransom from Ida Sackheim. After the verdicts were read, Eugen Weidmann was asked if he'd like to say anything, and he just shook his head no. As for his accomplices, they mostly fared better. Blanc had never been as trusted by Weidmann as Miel was, so he really didn't know a lot. Additionally, he had not killed anyone. He was found guilty of harboring criminals and was sentenced to 20 months in prison. Colette Tricot had also not committed any murder. She was charged with receiving the proceeds of murder but was acquitted. Her defense throughout the investigation and the trial was that she knew the goods she received were stolen, but did not know that any of it had come from murder victims. 
Miel was found guilty of attempted extortion of ransom and for his participation in the murders of Keller and LeBlanc. Like Weidmann, he was sentenced to death. Unlike Weidmann, he was quite calm when his verdicts were announced. Miel was reported to have screamed his innocence. He begged the magistrate, quote, don't convict me, I am innocent. I was an instrument in Weidmann's hands. The jury in the case also awarded 120,000 francs to the DeKoven family. It's considerably less than the 200,000 they had asked for. This financial penalty was to be shouldered by the entire group that was charged, although papers noted that since only Jean Blanc had any money, the burden would likely all fall to him. I never found anything that indicated whether this award was ever paid out or not. It was like literally mentioned as a weird coda in one of the trial wrap-ups. For the next several months, Weidmann and Mignon waited in prison for their sentences to be carried out, and we will talk about that after we hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. On June 14th, two and a half months after the sentencing, the lawyers representing both Weidmann and Million went to the Élysée Palace to formally plead for clemency for their clients. Both men were hoping their sentences would be reduced to life in prison, although the prevailing opinion of both the public and legal experts was that Weidmann had no chance at a commuted sentence. He was older than Million and very clearly the ringleader. On June 17, 1939, at 4.32 a.m., Eugen Weidmann was executed by guillotine on a scaffold that was erected outside Versailles Men's Prison in Louis Bartou Square. The Monsieur de Paris, the public executioner, was Jules de Fourneau, who had inherited the job from his uncle. It was a massive draw for spectators, many of whom had spent the night before partying in Paris before making the drive or taking the train out to Versailles to see the man who had become the most frightening figure of the day put to death. Estimates for attendance usually put it around 3,000 people. Police had to be stationed around the guillotine to maintain a border that the crowd could not push past. In attendance, among others, was the mother of Roger Leblanc. Initially, Weidmann resisted as he was led out of the prison to his sentence and was, according to write-ups in the U.S. press, quote, snarling in fury. He was angry that he was to be killed while his close accomplice, Roger Millon, had been spared. His death sentence commuted to life in prison two days earlier. But the closer Eugen got to the scaffold, the less he resisted. According to press reports, his attorneys gave a statement that Weidmann, quote, lived like a monster, and died like a saint. There was no end of coverage about this execution. Three days after it happened, the Midland Daily Telegraph of Coventry published a lengthy piece titled, I Witness a Public Execution. The attribution for it was simply our Paris correspondent, and it's surprising how non-sensational it is. It opens with, quote, I want to describe soberly and exactly what a public execution is like. I don't want to take sides for or against the execution of murderers or to discuss the propriety or otherwise of executions in public. And the write-up stays fairly true to that, and it does describe the whole situation in detail. The crowd immediately near the prison, so right up near the scaffold, was mostly 18 to 20-year-olds who had taken the midnight train from Paris to Versailles. The cafes in the blocks surrounding the prison were described as also open all through the night and filled with more diverse age ranges of people, many of whom were debating the merits of capital punishment. Even hours before the actual execution, the police had difficulty with the crowd. At 2 a.m. when the guillotine arrived, police had to force onlookers to move so that the cart could pass through the crowd. Several fights broke out among the onlookers. Several people were reported to have fainted. The arrival of the executioner was accounted for, and then the moment of execution. The Midland Daily Telegraph does not describe Weidemann as snarling, but rather entirely silent, even as he tried to break away from his escorts. In this account's conclusion, it mentions that it's inherently upsetting for someone to witness such a thing, regardless of their position on the issue of the death penalty. Quote, The violent assault of physical horror upon the tensed onlooker is not to be described in measured terms and cold print. 
And the frenzy of the crowd in attendance at Weidmann's execution was a major factor in the end of public guillotining. There had been some very real concerns that police might not be able to maintain the peace, and the French government moved swiftly to address the problem. On June 25, 1939, the following brief article appeared in the New York Times. Quote, The cabinet issued a decree today abolishing the age-old French custom of holding executions in public. This makes Eugen Weidmann, executed last week for the murder of Jean de Coven, Brooklyn dancer, the last criminal to undergo decapitation in the open. Indeed, it is believed the cabinet's decision was prompted by objectionable publicity and incidents surrounding the guillotining of Weidmann. The article goes on to describe the general atmosphere of mayhem around the prison. The crowd reportedly got really out of hand when the execution was delayed briefly, stamping their feet and yelling. But perhaps more than any issue with the crowd, the French government was horrified when the day after the execution, candid photographs of the event ran in a number of papers. According to the article, quote, these had been taken in defiance of a strict ban on photographs. The determination of the French cabinet was that executions would take place inside prisons going forward. Clergymen and magistrates would be the only attendees allowed. In 1977, France held its last execution by guillotine when Hamida Jamboudi was put to death for the murder of Elizabeth Bouquet. In 1981, the death penalty was abolished in France after efforts of Robert Barrette, Minister of Justice, during the presidency of François Mitterrand. The abolition of the death penalty became incorporated into the French Constitution after it passed a vote in the Congress of the French Parliament in 2007. Oh, there's so much to unpack here. Yeah. Do you have maybe some uh, less heavy listener mail? Oh, yes. You know, when I do a a horrible one, um, I got to do some fun things. So I have two. They're both fairly short, and they're both about food. (laughs) Uh, The first one is from our listener, Maria, who writes, Hello, ladies. I'm currently four months pregnant and getting caught up in the last few months of podcasts. When I listened to the eponymous food episode, I had to make fettuccine Alfredo after you talking about it. I'm at that stage where if I hear something I want, I need to eat it or I will fixate on it for days until it is resolved. Sadly, I don't currently have the energy to make it from scratch, but thankfully I had a jar in the pantry. Had to share my funny story with y'all and hope you appreciate it. Thank you for all you do. Uh, I wanted to read this so I could say, I do not have the pregnancy excuse. I work the same way. If I think about a food, I have to have it. Uh, (laughs) And also, I just want to say congratulations, Maria, and wish you good health and a smooth uh, rest of your pregnancy. I'm very excited, and I hope it all goes well. Uh, And then my other one is about waffles. So it's a little bit of a throwback to an earlier episode. From our listener, Christian, who writes, Hello, Holly and Tracy. I've been listening to your podcast for many years and love how informative you are. I've been meaning to write you for more than a year about the episode on the history of waffles, but I usually listen to you when I'm out and about, so I kept forgetting to do it when I was home. I'm originally from Columbia, but live in Vancouver, Canada. After listening to your podcast, I realized that a popular Colombian snack that we have called obleas had the same origin as waffles. I was in shock when you mentioned that name in your episode. At the same time of listening to that episode, I had formed a pandemic bubble with a guy from Belgium who had just moved to Vancouver. I realized that Oblea is called gaufret in French, and I knew that we were both going to be good friends, but after listening to your podcast, we felt like long-lost brothers. Thanks so much for all of the work you do. Listen, food brings people together, and it's important. Mm Mm-hmm. And now I want waffles and fettuccine alfredo, so it's going to be an interesting lunchtime. Uh, If you would like to write to us, again, keep sending these light things because they're good for the strangely depressing things I keep focusing on uh, as a a little salve at the end. You could do that at HistoryPodcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.